So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our <laughs> to our final panel on regional cooperation in the Western Balkans. My name is Dr. Richard Hooker. I was formerly the dean of the NATO Defense College, and I currently serve as the senior director for NATO in Europe at the National Security Council um, in the White House. I'd like to uh, begin by thanking and acknowledging uh, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, back to this. He's uh, a great friend and mentor of mine, and it's always a great pleasure to see you again, sir. So thank you very much. For the next 90 minutes or so, it will be my pleasure to host this distinguished panel. If I may, uh, may open up the panel with just a few brief remarks. Since the end of the Cold War and the signing of the Dayton Accords, the Western Balkans nations have entered a new phase, gaining their independence, installing democratic governments, and striving for economic growth and stability. Their path has not been easy or smooth. Lingering ethnic enmities, political disputes, corruption, Russian disinformation and subversion, and economic underperformance are just some of the problems faced by these new democracies. It goes without saying that it is very much in Europe's interest and the world's to see the Western Balkan states thrive politically and economically, safe within their borders and at peace with their neighbors. The European Union and NATO can potentially play a major role in helping these states achieve true security, stability, and prosperity. And this morning, our distinguished panelists will offer their insights on this important topic. At this time, I would like to introduce our speakers to you. Uh, beginning on my right, uh, Zoltan Martinez uh, serves with the General Secretariat of the Council of the European Union in Brussels. Gordana Delic is the Director of the Balkan Trust for Democracy in Belgrade. Hakon Blankenborg is the Director of the Western Balkans Section in the Norwegian Foreign Ministry. And Michelle Sousa, uh, works with the Operations Division on the International Staff in NATO. All four are experts in the Western Baltics, and we are very fortunate to have them with us today. We will begin with remarks from each panelist, and then we will follow with a question and answer period uh, and take questions from the floor. So without uh, further ado, uh, Zoltan, may I offer you the floor? Thank you very much. Um, and before I share with you the view from the Brussels bubble. Um, let me congratulate Alessandro uh, uh, for this uh, fantastic conference that you put together, all together the fantastic operation of the NATO Defense College Foundation. This is truly remarkable, so congratulations. Um, I will um, say uh, uh, just a few words about the state of play, uh, where we are, then perhaps a few words about regional uh, uh, cooperation and uh, I will conclude by uh, a bit of a perspective for the, for the coming year, which is going to be, I think, a fairly intensive year for, uh, for the Western Balkans. I mean, just to put, uh, put the regional uh, cooperation in context, let me just say um, uh, 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 a few words on where we are. Uh, the EU approach to the Western Balkans is a mix of regional and, and individual elements. The strategy, as you know, is uh, the perspective is, is, is fairly regional. The Thessaloniki commitment of 2004, whereby the, uh, the whole region is, is offered a, uh, uh, a European perspective. Of course, um, the play um, and the implementation of that perspective is, is on a bilateral basis, uh, bilateral accession perspectives. Um, and we are negotiating currently with Montenegro and Serbia. Actually, two chapters are going to be opened for each country uh, in December. Uh, Albania and Macedonia enjoy candidate status. With Bosnia, we have the questionnaire process for the time being. Um, and with Kosovo, the EU signed the Stabilization and Association Agreement, which I think was a major step forward. And we do have a perspective for visa liberalization, provided certain conditions are being met. So in that sense, there is progress. Now, I found it um, um, uh, interesting yesterday that uh, for most of the speakers, the references were somewhat negative uh, for the past few years. 
everybody referred to President Juncker's statement uh, uh, of a few years ago when he uh, said that perhaps enlargement is going to be on the back burner during his presidency and during the tenure of this commission. But I would like to paint a slightly more positive picture because um, um, obviously we make progress, not only in the technical sense, but also in the political sense. Um, you might recall that uh, this year in March, the European Council confirmed its commitment to the uh, uh, enlargement perspective of the region as a whole. Then President Juncker made a few announcements in his uh, a State of the European Union speech in September, where he announced a new strategy. Uh, we expect the, um, uh, the Commission country report uh, April next year, and there is an um, expectation that the Commission is going to make some recommendations to, um, uh, to carry on with the process of accession negotiations. And of course, um, uh, a Western Balkan summit has been announced for the 17th of May in Sofia, uh, a summit between the EU member states and the Western Balkans uh, leaders. Uh, in a way, this will be a first uh, such summit since Thessaloniki uh, 2004. So I would say there is a quite clear reflection uh, of the European commitment uh, to the Western Balkans. But um, if you look at the actual situation on the ground, it's not necessarily uh, uh, always positive uh, what we see, um, and particularly in terms of deliverable to the, to the peoples on the daily life, at the kitchen table, not at the summit table, but at the kitchen table, uh, we have uh, uh, a few uh, developments which are not yet fully satisfactory. Uh, problems remain. You see insufficient growth in the Western Balkans countries. Um, you see a very high degree of youth unemployment there. A degree of economic inactivity, uh, difficulties of access to finance, lack of foreign investment, very low regional trade. So the question was um, how we could overcome uh, these problems. And one of the uh, approaches uh, the EU is promoting and advocating is regional economic cooperation as a booster uh, to the economic situation and the socio-economic situation in the Western Balkans. Now, this is not without precedent. We do have the Central European Free Trade Agreement. We do have the Southeast Europe 2020 strategy, which already focused on jobs and prosperity. The Stabilization and Association Agreements with the Western Balkans countries uh, uh, include a free trade element as well, but more was required. So um, I think the framework uh, that everybody is aware of was the Berlin process. Uh, we started in 2014, and there have been already some uh, 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 major deliverables in that process in terms of commitment, like in 2015 in Vienna, uh, the participants agreed a connectivity uh, uh, agenda. In 2016 in Paris, they agreed on the concept of a regional market for electricity. Uh, and in 2017, the Western Balkans Transport Community Treaty was signed after nine years of negotiations. This is a major step forward. This is a community between the Western Balkans and the European Union. This is very much promoting the connectivity agenda, the integration of the Western Balkans with the EU transport market, and of course promoting regional connectivity. But I think the, the real breakthrough is the 2017 Trieste uh, Summit and the multi-annual action plan for regional economic area adopted at the Trieste Summit, uh, which is a joint approach to economic cooperation in the Western Balkans. It is a structured agenda for regional economic cooperation, promoting trade integration, creating a regional investment space, facilitating regional mobility, and creating a digital integration agenda uh, for the region. Now, the idea would be to facilitate the flow of goods, services, capital, and highly skilled labor. And it's not a coincidence that these ideas actually coincide with the four freedoms, the four fundamental freedoms of the, of the uh, European Union. Uh, this is a market of 18 million people. This could attract investment uh, in a much higher scale, and this could unleash the economic potential of the region. Now, there are a few questions which need to be answered quickly. First of all, whether this is instead of EU integration. And the very clear answer is no. This is not instead of. This is in addition to or actually in preparation for EU integration. It requires the very same institutional reforms. 
It requires a uh, fight against corruption. It requires uh, 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 judicial reform, the improvement of the business environment, the uh, doing away of red tape. Um, it requires the very same reform and regulatory framework that we talk about in the context of preparation for EU membership. And this is why it has uh, full support uh, from the EU, from the European Commission. So in conclusion, um, um, I would like to come back a little bit to the title of this conference. It says, Western Balkans at a crossroads. And I would say I slightly disagree with the, with the title of the conference. Um, crossroads implies there's a choice to be made. I think the choice has been made already, both by the Western Balkans and by the European Union. The commitment is quite clear. We do have a lot of homework to do, for example, in terms of public support, not only in the Western Balkans, not even primarily in the Western Balkans, maybe within the European Union as well. But the choice has been made. But it remains, and this is what I would like to underline as a closing thought, it will remain a performance-based uh, uh, enterprise. So it will remain ultimately individual in the, in the judgment of, uh, of the individual countries. It will remain merit-braced, and there is no strategic shortcut. Um, uh, to EU membership. But based on what we plan for 2018 in the European Union, I can almost guarantee, you never guarantee anything in politics, but I can almost guarantee that 2018 is going to be a great year for the Western Balkans. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Sultan. Ms. Telich, the floor is yours. Um, I wish I could be as optimistic as you are. <laughs> Um, although I perfectly, I totally agree with you that um, the picture is not as negative as very often is painted from the Western Balkans. But I'd li really like to remind us of the fact that the Balkans have been um, a platform for a successful transatlantic cooperation. And I think that the involvement of the U.S. is very important in the Balkans. However, over the past decade, the United States have sought to decrease its involvement and commitments in the Balkans by passing this on to the EU, given uh, both its proximity, proximity and also the greater leverage to encourage political and economic reforms, the ones that we have just heard of. But also we need to remind ourselves that the EU since 2008 has been rather distracted and faced with its own challenges. And they started with a financial crisis, uh, through the Greek fiscal crisis, uh, through migration crisis, finally Brexit. And all of that has been topped uh, with uh, foreign negative and illiberal forces that are trying to influence and put the foothold in the region. So the, all these have soared the EU attitudes towards the enlargement. So it is not insignificant what Mr. Juncker said, although we have seen um, different narrative in the past several months towards the region, which is a very, very positive development, and I think that the region has re regained a new boost through this new narrative. Now, I think that the vacuum that has been created for these liberal forces to place the strong foothold in the region, and especially we are talking here about Russia and Turkey that have been gaining uh, political influence, <coughs> Um, the Arab states that are able to spread a hardline vision of the Islam in the Balkans. These external influences are playing a huge role in the Balkans, and these exter external influences form what, in my view, is a dangerous mix with ethnic tensions, the political polarization, and the rise of liberal and autocratic regimes in the region. Western Balkans are an important part of the European peace project. We have heard that yesterday as well. And if we want the European peace project to be complete, we must remain engaged uh, in the Western Balkans. However, as even Krastev puts it nicely, um, the Balkans are the soft underbelly of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. We have in the next, I think, 18 months, some contingency planning to do. To avoid uh, not losing the region, but to avoid the region be so um, um, influenced by the illiberal forces that I have mentioned, we must accelerate the EU and NATO membership. 
I would argue, though, that this process should be by far more political in the next 18 months than it has thus far. I would argue that it has to be by far less technical and technocratic than it has been thus far. And for that, we would need to develop, in my mind, a new set of tools and a new set of carrots and stick, if you, carrots and sticks, if you want. So, the Western Balkan countries, what is a really good development and has been um, clear, even in this vacuum that has been created, have understood that the regional cooperation in, is in their very best interest for three dimensions, the political, economic, and security. Uh, Mr. Zoltan spoke about those, so I don't need to. But if the question is what it is that the international community or transatlantic community should be doing, I would say that it needs to remain focused on, on, on developments that it has been focused also since 2000, the first, actually, summit that took place in Zagreb, and then in Thessaloniki summit in 2003, where we discussed that the institution building and separation of powers and separation of public-private uh, uh, um, relations needs to be in, in a focus. Second is the justice and home affairs with a focus on organized crime and corruption. Cross-border cooperation um, by promoting economic and social cooperation, especially in the border regions and among youth, plus the involvement of the civil society for this specifically, the involvement of the civil society is going to be essential. Private sector development by promoting the FDI, however, foreign direct investment, however, not the foreign direct investment of suspicion origin as we are seeing it lately. Uh, the infrastructure development through initiatives in the sectors of transport, energy environment, and information society, which the Western Balkan Summit uh, the three last Western Balkan summit have, have increasingly uh, been putting on the agenda. Youth focus must be uh, uh, in the forefront and it should be the cross-cutting theme for everything. And I'm really pleased to have seen the establishment of the Regional Youth Cooperation Office, which is a, a cross-regional uh, and, uh, and a cross-sectoral <coughs> effort where the countries have, uh, have established that with the seat of Tirana and with the huge involvement of the civil society. The unfinished business with political parties, for example, I would mention. We have trained political parties really well how to win the elections, but we have never worked on the democratization process of the political parties from within. And this gets then translated on how they govern the countries, and this is one of the reasons why we have autocratic regimes. The unfinished business with specific issues, such as in Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, and even perhaps Macedonia. I think that some diplomatic efforts requi are required to mediate certain hotspots in um, countries that I mentioned. And then the energy dependency on Russia. This is one of the key things that needs to be tackled and especially in the following 18 months. I think we really need to work on diversity of the energy sources in the Balkans. And number 10, I would say, is to prevent the foreign meddling into the elect electoral processes in, in the Western Balkans, because we have seen too many of these, and especially by Russia. So the Berlin process gave some palpable results and concrete results both in the infrastructure and in strategies, for example, towards youth. It, is also, it has also initiated the Western Balkan Summit in Vienna, in Paris, in Trieste, and the next one is going to be in London, although the UK is Brexiting. In Trieste, we focused on connectivity, economic integration, and people-to-people -people content. And these three will be very important in the following 18 months just as well. Let me just remind you that um, I think we are on schedule here. And I think in the following nine to 18 months, the timing of and the sequence of actions that we do will be of absolutely critical importance. How and when and what is done 
in order to allow for the Balkan countries to keep their integrity and not be a subject of foreign influences at the level they are or they could be is going to play a crucial role in their strive to become part of the European Union family. So in London, I'd like to say that the cross-cutting theme, because we recently had a uh, discussion about the Western Balkan Summit in London, the cross-cutting theme will be youth, it will be digital, but it will also focus very much on security and it will also focus on, on um, creating and building a digital market, but secure digital market for the Western Balkan countries. So it is very important that the commitments made through the Berlin process and signed at these summits be implemented. One of them is, for example, RICO, which is the Regional Youth Cooperation Office. The Western Balkan countries need to fulfill their promise and fill up the budget, for example, of that institution, intra-governmental and intra-regional institution that they have created with the help of the Franco-German office. So all of this will play a role in the following nine to, t nine to 18 months. And why following nine to 18 months? I think it is also because we have heard of different approaches to all topics. So we have heard that again, even borders are, the disc um, are on the table again. So the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue and the potential swapping of the region um, or swapping of land, how they call it, is again on the table. All of these must be under very careful monitoring of the international, of the transatlantic community to avoid that they go in a wrong direction. And I assure you that the foreign influences that I've talked about here have it in their interest that this does not go in a direction that we here would want it to go. So with this, I will conclude. Gordana, thanks for those terrific insights. Um, Hake on the floor is yours. Thank you. And let me also thank uh, the NATO Defense uh, College Foundation and Ambassador Minotoritsu in particular for having kept uh, the Western Balkans on the agenda in a period where it nearly uh, disappeared. Uh, now we are in a uh, totally different uh, situation. Over the last uh, six months, uh, it, uh, the Western Balkans has elevated nearly to the top of the agenda uh, all over Europe, uh, Russia included. Um, so uh, this is a timely uh, conference again. And what has happened over the last uh, uh, six months, uh, Mr. Zoltan uh, uh, mentioned a number of these events. I would mention uh, one more, and that was the uh, speech by Foreign Minister Gabriel in, uh, in Berlin and May uh, in the uh, Aspen conference, where he talked about the need for a Berlin process reloaded, or later called the uh, Berlin pl uh, process plus. Uh, and this is an indication uh, that uh, uh, the integration and the cooperation of the Western Balkans into the wider European uh, cooperation is something more than the reforms uh, leading up to the membership in the European Union. And now it's uh, more uh, about the inter interdependence between the Western Balkans and the rest of Europe. So it, it's, uh, it's in the interest both of the countries in the region and of the other countries in Europe. Uh, and this uh, feels, uh, so to say, uh, makes the picture more complete uh, when we are also take in uh, the State of the Union speech by, by President Juncker and, of course, the conclusions from, from Trieste. Then we have an, a new picture of uh, the uh, uh, Western Balkans in Europe uh, compared with what we had six months ago. Uh, now, where is uh, the, uh, the other player in this, uh, the, the U.S.? Uh, I, I think I will leave that to the uh, Q&A where the uh, U.S. is uh, heading, but it's uh, uh, in, on, in the Western Balkans, but it, they, at least what I can observe, it's, it's a more visible U.S. again also in the Balkans. But this is mainly a European affair. Uh, 
And now with this um, clear uh, focus on the interdependence between the Western Balkans and the rest of Europe, what, uh, what will happen in the next uh, phase? Uh, well, I think we will see uh, a deeper commitment from a number of countries uh, in Europe on the Western Balkans. Um, commitment politically, uh, hopefully also uh, financially. Um, the, um, this uh, bilateral approach uh, has to be combined with the uh, Berlin process, with, uh, which have the additional instruments to what the EU institutions can, can offer on the uh, membership uh, path. The, um, if, if this continued, uh, continues, uh, the, uh, I agree uh, with what was said earlier, I think I would go even a step further, the 2018 might become the year of the Western Balkans uh, in, in Europe. But it very much uh, depends on uh, if uh, we, I, my own country included, uh, and the other countries uh, remain committed, and of course, if the countries in the region remain committed and do the really hard work with the reform programs. Now, uh, it should be said that the, the Western Balkans is, is a complicated affair, and some said, is, is it on the crossroads? Yes, it has always been on the crossroads and will uh, maybe be there, but that's not the point. The point is that uh, from time to time, we have a different definition of what is the Western Balkans, and different countries in Europe uh, have a different uh, definition of what, uh, what the Western Balkans uh, contains, which countries are included. Um, some, uh, some countries, uh, when they join the European Union, are suddenly not more the, uh, the Western Balkans, and so on and so on. I think what, what now is much clearer is that we are talking about the Western Balkans 6. Um, and if that's a region, uh, it uh, in a way remained to be seen. I would agree with what Ivan Vejvoda said yesterday. It's more of regional contact and regional cooperation that we often uh, think about in, in this uh, part of Europe. Uh, on the other hand, it's a very diverse uh, mix of countries. Uh, so if it's a region, I, it remained to be seen. What they have in common, uh, the six countries is, of course, that they are not members of the European Union, but all of them uh, have the aspiration to become a member. On the other hand, some of the countries are members of NATO. And it should be said maybe one of the main events of the 2017 was the uh, Montenegrin membership in NATO. Uh, but it makes the, the so-called region more complex, some NATO, some non-NATO, uh, all of them non-EU. Uh, so. Uh, one of the common challenges they have is, of course, that they, uh, they are struggling to catch up with their neighbors, uh, which are in the, in the EU. Economically, to catch up with the neighbors, uh, the gap is wider and wider, so uh, they, they need to, to catch up. That's a common interest. Um, it's, uh, why is it an interest from the rest of Europe? Why is this interdependence? Uh, of course, uh, history shows that uh, it's an interdependence. On the other hand, uh, the most recent event shows that, yes, we, uh, the rest of Europe should be interested in a closer integration of these countries. The migration crisis showed us that uh, this is not a part of Europe uh, way uh, far away, it's uh, in the middle. So people uh, entering uh, the Western Balkans from the Schengen EU uh, with the ambition to enter an another Schengen EU country, uh, yes, that's, uh, that's the Western Balkans. So. Uh, some have said that the Western Balkans, uh, and now I mean the Western Balkans 6, uh, is what the European Union makes it of it. And I think that uh, it, uh, now the European Union and the other countries in Europe have a kind of a defining power on uh, what, what will happen. Uh, some of the initiatives uh, that has come about lately uh, could be... Uh, uh, kind of a, a game changer here, and I would mention in particular, as the, uh, some of the other speakers have done, the regional economic area, the area. Uh, that uh, could be the beginning of something completely new. And uh, because it uh, entails a lot of other reforms, uh, it contains a lot of other programs, so uh, the regional economic area could make this uh, part of Europe more of an integrated region. Now, it has also been uh, met by uh, certain objections, uh, valid objections, 
uh, from the region that it, as uh, Mr. Scholtan mentioned, it will replace the EU, and the other one it will be dominated by the biggest country in the region, Serbia. Uh, valid uh, objections, uh, both of them. But on the other hand, uh, as Mr. Scholtan said, what what is the uh, what is the alternative? Uh, the, uh, if uh, one do not manage to uh, implement the reforms required by the EU, uh, yes, then you don't become a member. And maybe this is, this is the instrument to um, prepare for the EU uh, membership uh, by a, an internal market, more or less, uh, in the region. And on the other one, uh, other objection, if it's dominated by the biggest economy, yes, the biggest economy would always benefit but the, the weakest economies are those most dependent on international regulations and, uh, 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 and uh, the uh, international laws, because the biggest one will always win if you don't have the international regulations. So, uh, I mean, the REA is the flagship. It's the symbol of something new uh, in, in the making. And uh, if we have these um, uh, various initiatives, bilateral initiatives by the Berlin Process Plus uh, and the uh, reinforced uh, integration process in the European Union, yes, then we will see the 2018 as probably the year of the uh, uh, Western Balkans. Let me add at the end, the, uh, there are some other aspects as well. The security part of this and the defense part of this. Uh, the NATO has one institution in particular which is normally considered to be the guarantor of security and stability in the region. The K4 is already there. Uh, the K4 should be the link between NATO and the countries in the region because it's respected by all, it's accepted by all. This is the key instrument for stability and security. So take it from there and develop the cooperation with the various countries in this diverse uh, region into a, a deeper partnership with NATO, whether the countries have the aspiration to become members or not. K4 is a key link. And even down to details. We man I mentioned that the, uh, uh, there's an independence. Some, some details has to be observed by the countries, by the partners. When um, the... Uh, uh, whereas countries are now developing their uh, tech, uh, technology platforms, it is extremely important that when they're doing this uh, procurement, the uh, interoperability with the rest of Europe is important. The system included should be uh, of the kind that they communicate with the rest of Europe, that they are accepted by the rest of Europe then we will have a complete uh, Europe communicating on the most sensitive issues uh, from migration to security and defense. So please observe also the technical part of the uh, procurement processes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haikon and Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, and uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the Foundation for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here, and especially Ambassador Minuto Rizzo, who is a longtime friend and uh, put this conference together. Uh, I'm also very pleased to be here in Italy because Italy is a great contributor to the NATO operations and in particular to K4, uh, having provided for many years now uh, the commanders to the force. Uh, we have now uh, General Cuoci uh, that just took office uh, a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Uh, so uh, it's uh, all the more important uh, to have this discussion in Italy uh, today. Uh, I agree with Zoltan, you know, uh, on uh, the progress. <clears throat> For me also, if we see the glass, I think the glass is half full, more than half empty. And uh, there's a tendency in the Western Balkans to always complain and uh, to drama. Uh, but indeed, in the end, uh, the region is much better today than it was, you know, uh, 20 years ago. And everybody will agree with me on that. Uh, so it doesn't mean we should not continue to uh, look forward to progress, but it means also we have to uh, accept our achievements, you know, because otherwise, you know, we are always, you know, uh, self-whipping ourselves and this is not productive. Uh, one of the reasons of that is that over the past years, you know, we had 
free and fair elections in the region, you know, uh, this is not the case everywhere in the world. And uh, what I see, because I travel to the region very often, more and more the concerns of the region are the concerns of our own countries. I would mention terrorism, I would mention corruption, uh, and uh, for instance, I was uh, at a conference we organized in Kosovo a few weeks ago, and then you had this lady standing and complaining about gender diversity in Kosovo, and that's also a problematics we have in NATO these days. So, uh, and indeed in Kosovo you were the first female president, you know, with President Yayaga. So this means the concern of these countries are our concerns, and this means normalization, and I think that's a very positive step. But of course today we have a problem. Why? Because the Western Balkans, and this was said by the previous speakers also, is not on the top priority of the world agenda. And clearly there are other priorities and bigger priorities. <clears throat> it's not for me to say what is the hierarchy between priorities, but it's clear that the Western Balkans compared with the 90s is not anymore on the top, uh, on the top line. And that's a bit of a problem. That's why it's so important that you know uh, this conference has been organized and that we keep the focus on the Western Balkans because for me it's very important. It's a region that although it's not today a top priority for the international community, it's a region that uh, has a strategic interest for all of us and we have to be extremely careful you know, to, to to make sure you know it goes in the right direction and all our efforts you know are uh, rewarded and indeed nato is committed to regional stability in the in the western balkans it's a long effort we've been there uh, for uh, 20 years now uh, even more than 20 years. Uh, we started in 1995 in Bosnia and then we moved to Kosovo. We had uh, this uh, operation also in Macedonia. So we've done a lot uh, for this region. And uh, I think it would be a pity to see all this investment, you know, wasted, you know, uh, because of a bad management of a lack of, or a lack of interest. And that's why we have to continue, you know, uh, to, to, to work, you know, with the Western Balkans. Uh, but of course, it's a two-way street. And uh, it's not only uh, the Western Balkans that have to open their arms to receive the presents, it's also for them to do their homework. Uh, and this is sometimes uh, not a very nice message for them to hear, but for me, I think we have to act with people, uh, like responsible people, uh, and if they want uh, assistance, they can get it, but they have also to do their part of the way. And that's the way also we grow together and we benefit uh, from the, the process, you know, on both sides. NATO's role in the Western Balkans. So first of all, that was mentioned also by the previous speakers, we have some countries in the region that are already NATO members. Uh, the latest example was Montenegro. And I think, you know, uh, more than uh, the accession of Montenegro to NATO, it was very important in the sense that it sent a signal, and that was said yesterday in the conference, of the door remaining open. And that's very important, because I don't know when will be the next uh, accession to NATO in the future, given the current budgetary constraints. But at least the fact that Montenegro acceded, you know, uh, uh, NATO means that the door is not closed. And that's very important for the other countries. And of course, when I talked about the other countries, I think about Serbia, I think about Bosnia and Herzegovina, I think about Macedonia, because both of them, all of them, the three of them, have an individual partnership cooperation program uh, with a perspective to become a NATO member one day, but yesterday again, this was raised. For Bosnia, you have this problem, you know, of the Tallinn conditions, and uh, for uh, Macedonia, you have the problem of the name, in addition to all the reforms that were mentioned by many speakers, that have to be carried forward, you know. And uh, yesterday, and on this I want to make a special point, many speakers said, yes, but the membership of uh, Bosnia or FIRA may help. Uh, yes, maybe it may, and I take the point, but I tell you that's not the temperature in NATO. In NATO, you know, the consensus is intransigence. The Tallinn conditions have to be respected for Bosnia, for sure, and the name has to be uh, sold for FIROM. So that's where we are today. So uh, it's true that maybe there would be some benefit in membership, but that's far away from the consensus. As you know, the beauty of NATO is consensus. So <laughs> the beauty and maybe sometimes the ugliness, but that's the, the way we work. So uh, in those three countries, Serbia, Bosnia, and uh, FIROM, we have liaison offices military liaison offices, and on this we help them with the uh, implementation of reforms necessary uh, to uh, the NATO path. Uh, this is a good work, you know, it's small offices, it's very modest, but it's a good cooperation. I think it's valued by all these countries. And 
in my view, it's also very important to keep this NATO footprint because it's symbolic also, although it's not a huge presence, you know, and it gives a, a guarantee of stability and uh, NATO's interest. Of course, I will dwell a bit more on uh, Kosovo because Kosovo, uh, and I'm very happy uh, to uh, the previous predecessor, uh, previous speaker, uh, Akon, you know, to have talked about the role of, uh, of K4, because in the end, you know, K4 today is the biggest uh, NATO operation, as strange as it may look. We still have uh, more or less 4,000 troops uh, in Kosovo, and uh, this is, of course, uh, a warrantor of stability in the middle of the Western Balkans. Uh, it's clear that the situation in uh, Kosovo these days is stable. Uh, we call it stable but fragile in our assessments, but in the end it's stable. You know, we haven't seen major uh, disruption uh, in the past uh, month. Uh, so this means, you know, uh, it's normalized, but uh, this presence is very important. And in this, you know, it's clear that the first pillar of NATO presence, K4, uh, is these days, you know, a strong commitment by the organization because if you remember, uh, three, four years ago, there was a big tendency from NATO nations to withdraw. Uh, you had big countries, uh, the UK, France, that withdrew their presence from K4. This trend has been reverted now. And in the past two years, we see a commitment to the Western Balkans through K4 because of all the things that were discussed in this conference, because of all the signs of possible instability. So you have a renewed commitment to this presence. And today, as I say, the fourth generation conferences, which were dramatic three, four years ago, are much better. And indeed, we get the forces we need for K4. So this is a good sign, and it's a strong commitment you know, to security and stability in Kosovo, but also the wider region. That's the first pillar. But also in Kosovo, what we do is capacity building, and that's very important, because that's the future. That's also the ticket you know, for the countries to stand on their own feet. And this capacity building effort is done through a team we have there, the NATO advisory and liaison team, and uh, on this, we support the Kosovo security force uh, in different domains, you know, to get uh, professionalism. And this is a good thing, you know. I would mention also the fact that the Kosovo police these days deals with the normal, you know, uh, police tasks, you know, without K4 interference. So that's also a good progress, you know, for Kosovo. So this is a capacity building effort that is a second pillar of NATO's action. The third pillar is even more important because we have to think, and there I come, you know, uh, to the uh, NATO and EU, which is an important uh, relationship uh, uh, in this context. Uh, you had uh, Serbia that got accession negotiations in the European Union. And you had Kosovo getting the Association and Stabilization Agreement. In NATO, you have Serbia, I said it before, that has individual partnership. But then Kosovo had nothing. And we have the four non-recognizers, and this poses problem. Because then, what do we do? Because NATO as such doesn't recognize Kosovo. For NATO as an organization, Kosovo is still a UN protectorate under UN Security Council Resolution 1244. As weird as it may look, but that's a fact. And so if uh, the NATO Secretary General expresses a NATO position, he can only consider Kosovo as a UN protectorate. So this is a big limitation. <coughs> so this means we cannot talk about uh, Kosovo's partnership for peace, and we have to find other solution. So the solution was uh, imagined, you know, uh, to have, you know, a uh, decision at the Warsaw Summit to have a special relationship between NATO and Kosovo, which would be another wording for a kind of partnership, because the word partnership is a taboo. And uh, in this, you know, we couldn't succeed by the Warsaw Summit. This has succeeded only uh, by the end of last year. And uh, we have now this uh, special relationship that has been named, that's the uh, beauty of uh, NATO negotiations. Uh, it was named Enhanced Interaction. And that's what we have. But that's very important. Because to all of you that know well, uh, you know the subtleties you know of language, it's clear that Enhanced Interaction is a way to partnership, and in my view, it's a balance between Serbia and Kosovo, you know, uh, between NATO and the EU. So it means uh, Serbia has something in the EU and so has Kosovo, the same in NATO. And in this uh, Enhanced Interaction, we have two different things. The first one, in my view, is very important. That's the dialogue. In this, we have now 
twice more uh, counseled in K4 format in NATO, which is a political dialogue with Kosovo on Kosovo, that's important. We have also had just uh, on the 27th of October a uh, North Atlantic Council visit to Kosovo. That was the first one in four years, so that's more engagement. So that's a dialogue, that's very important. But we have also pragmatic cooperation. I mentioned before you know, this conference, we organized you know, uh, uh, a, few, uh, a few weeks ago uh, in Pristina, where you had countries of the region. And indeed, it's not a coincidence, but the theme of the conference was regional interaction, exactly what we are discussing in this panel. So I think that's very important because we have to show uh, Kosovo as a projector of stability and not as a consumer of stability. Uh, and this is worth for all the countries in the region. And I think the region as a whole, the Western Balkans, have to be perceived in the future as a projector of stability and not any longer as a consumer of security. But this, of course, uh, requires a few things. First of all, it requires a joint a concerted action by all the international community, because NATO is mostly a military organization, although it can have a political say if it's militarily efficient. Uh, but of course, uh, the European Union, the UN have other tools at their disposal, and all these organizations, including the OSCE, have to work together in the field of competence, because it's only the synergies that will produce success. But also, as I said before, and that's very important in my view, Countries in the region and the region itself have to gain maturity, continue to gain maturity, and work together for that. It's a two-way street. It's not just being recipients, it's also being providers. And uh, this will be difficult, it's a long road, but uh, I'm completely sure that together we can succeed and we will succeed. And I want to thank again uh, Ambassador Minuto Rizzo and Italy for organizing this conference because I think it's a topic which is very important, but it's clear that given the general uh, disinterest on the Western Balkans because of other topics of bigger importance in the international world, if the region doesn't take responsibility to also continue to be on the front scene, then we may have a risk, you know, of forgetting the Western Balkans and then to run to disaster in the future. Thank you very much. So thank you very much to all four of our speakers. Uh, I took copious notes and learned a lot from your presentations, which I will be happy to take back to Washington and share with my superiors. Uh, at this time, we're going to transition to the question and answer period. Uh, which we all look forward to, I know. I'd like to ask uh, uh, you, if you have a question, to please state your name and your affiliation. And to preserve time for other questions, may I ask you to keep your questions brief and to the point. And with that, let's open up the floor. Who has our first question, please? Yes, sir. My name is Lazar Komanescu. I'm a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Romania. I'd like to pick up on uh, one very important idea, in my opinion, which was mentioned here. Uh, the fact that uh, the development of regional cooperation in the Western Balkans should be and has to be looked at as a way to upgrade the perspective of uh, the integration of this region to the European Union, not something, uh, let's say, as a su substitute. Mm. And uh, here I include also the economic dimension of this uh, regional cooperation. Definitely the governments are important, uh, the most important in uh, determining uh, a positive approach towards the development of the regional cooperation, but there is yet another ex extremely important actor which has to be involved. And that's my question to the panels, uh, the business community. And so what could, one do, what, what could be done or what should be done so as to bring the business communities of these countries much closer to each other? Mm. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, in terms of uh, establishing uh, uh, business fora, business networking, and here I'd, I'd simply like to mention that uh, there will be in Bucharest next year a summit of the so-called 3C initiatives. And there in the margin of this, there will be a business forum organized and also the intention is to establish a network of the chambers of commerce 
of the countries participating, but also the, uh, the intention is to invite the chambers of commerce of the countries in the Western Balkans to take part in. So I think that this is an extremely important point and I want to hear the, 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 the view of the, of the panelists. And I will conclude by mentioning something which was also on the line yesterday. And there is a happy coincidence, in my opinion, in terms of the perspectives of the Western Balkans, uh, uh, European perspective. In the next six EU presidency of the Council of the European Union, four of these presidencies would be countries neighboring the region. It's Bulgaria, it's Romania, it's Croatia, it's Austria, and we should also take into account Germany, who is also part of this sixth next presidency. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to respond? So let me oh, yeah. Sure. I mean, um, uh, in terms of the, uh, of the business community, um, um, sure, uh, business fora are important, but I think uh, what the uh, regional uh, cooperation objective aims at is, is, is actually going beyond the idea of, of uh, conferences and, and networks. It, it aims at creating the very infrastructure of a regional economic framework. It aims at creating transport infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, the regulatory framework. <coughs> it, creates a, uh, it aims at creating a single investment area. I mean, the, the region altogether, six countries altogether, I think something like 18 million people. That's a sizable market. If you cut it down to six countries, uh, for many investors, they are way too small. If you bring them together, mm. that's already a, a, a reasonable target. So I think, yes, networking and connectivity, importance uh, uh, of, the, of the business uh, community, absolutely. But the objective is to create the necessary infrastructure in a physical sense and also in the regulatory sense uh, for that kind of uh, cooperation. Other comments? Yeah, I, I think uh, this intervention uh, shows exactly why it's so important uh, not to limit this regional economic area to, uh, to the Western Balkan 6. That should be just the beginning, uh, because if uh, the standards regulations of this um, uh, Western Balkan 6, the uh, regional economic area, is in full conformity with the European Union one, then it would uh, be just the preparatory phase for a wider uh, economic area, it means a European Union one, but it, it's a kind of a paradox that we always talk about the Western Balkans, never the Eastern Balkans, but all of this is Southeast Europe or whatever uh, we would like to, to call it. And in uh, the economic sense, it should, it should be one. Uh, so uh, this uh, new, as I see it, the new economic area should be the beginning of a wider eco business uh, opportunity for, for the whole region. Uh, it should utilize uh, the uh, uh, business uh, opportunities for all the countries in the region, but starting with the Western Balkans, six. Now, how much should this be, uh, so to say, planned and uh, uh, in, in detail? Um, it should be up to the business community and, and others to take initiatives under kind of the umbrella of this uh, new uh, regional economic area. But I would highlight one institution which has come into the limelight again, and that is the RCC. It was mentioned yesterday uh, as well. But we have an institution which could, can and will coordinate some of these efforts, and that's the RCC, the Regional uh, Cooperation Council in Sarajevo, where all, all countries in the region, east or west, north or south of the region, are partners or members. So uh, I would recommend to, to focus on the role of the RCC. I'd just like to add that um, internally also for the countries of the Western Balkans, the business community plays a huge role because it has a much greater leverage, if you want, in terms of changing the rule of law and have uh, an impact on the change of the rule of law. Uh, for instance, in Serbia, the American Chamber of Commerce that um, has many members, and many of these members are also Serbian domestic companies, have achieved to change over 170 legal acts uh, in, the, in the past decade, and this, this is not insignificant. So uh, there is also uh, an association of 100 business leaders in the region that is meeting annually and regularly, and all of these are making an effort to put 
uh, to push forward for certain reforms. So I believe that in terms of rule of law and the change and the reforms in, in this area, the business community plays a um, very important role, if not the most important role. Thank you. The next question, please. Yes, sir. of the IAI. Uh, I have a couple of short questions. One uh, for Dr. Delic. Uh, she mentioned the idea of uh, land swapping. This was one of my pet arguments some years ago, but uh, I was uh, sure that it was not realistic. Now I, I hear that uh, someone is thinking about it. Can you tell me something more? And the second question is, uh, is uh, for Mr. Sula and also for uh, Blankenburg because uh, we had a plan years ago of uh, a set of gates uh, in order to reduce the number of troops in Kosovo. Now I hear that uh, Kifor is going to, to stay there forever. Uh, I'm quite concerned about that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, well, the, the division of Kosovo of a long time ago or the swapping of the regions has actually been always something that was talked about, although in the past eight or ten years it was something that was almost like a taboo topic that nobody wanted to talk about. And this is also because um, it does create certain difficulties uh, and it could trigger certain chain reactions. So it was always referred to something as opening a Pandora's box. However, um, last year there was this report, I think it came from um, a German political analyst that did talk about the creation of the, of the big three in the region. And this was the big Croatia, the big Serbia, and the big Albania. And this report did trigger a lot of resentment in the region and it triggered a lot of resentment because people were afraid that it could uh, end up in conflict. But we have heard in the last six months that there is a possibility and a slight chance perhaps for, uh, let me allow to say it, a modest swap of, uh, of land between Kosovo and Serbia in order to assure that Serbia could potentially maybe recognize Kosovo um, and uh, or accept Kosovo's um, uh, entrance into the UN and other international structures. Now all of this is still very much up in the air, although we have also heard that um, certain politicians have discussed that. Unfortunately, these conversations um, are behind the closed doors. I do not know the um, details of it. However, should this be an option, I would really argue that the international community must keep very focused on that, not trigger the further and the chain reaction in the region. Because this is a very, this could potentially be a great peaceful project for Kosovo and Serbia, but it could also be potentially a very bloody project for the whole of the region because the consequences of it might not remain only between Kosovo and Serbia and actually would not interfere that much with Kosovo and Serbia as much as they would in Bosnia and probably Macedonia. So that's all I know about, about the recent conversation about the region swapping. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Thank you very much. Thanks, General, for your question. Indeed, it's a very good question and I didn't elaborate too much on that. But uh, you're completely correct, you know. When I mentioned, you know, that uh, a few years ago, uh, many nations unilaterally uh, started to withdraw from Kosovo and big nations like the UK, France, uh, then, you know, uh, what you refer to, I think, is the gate structure. The gates were the different steps, you know, to move from uh, the deterrent presence to a minimal and no presence in the future, where you had different steps, you know, that were quantified in terms of number of troops. Uh, was abandoned because then, of course, all these unilateral withdrawals questioned completely this process. And so the military have uh, proposed a new system which is much more flexible uh, to diminish, but not with these strict stages of the gates. Uh, that's what we have today. 
But as I say, from two years ago, uh, we have two instruments. One is one that is always in NATO, is a fourth generation conferences. And in these conferences, then we realized that nations were more interested in providing troops and then the K4 uh, troop levels were maintained. And second, you know, we have the comprehensive security assessments, which is a new tool, which is twice a year. And twice a year, at political level, nations decide whether they want to uh, keep the posture, increase it, or diminish it. And at this moment, as I explained, you know, we have a constant uh, among nations to keep the presence as it is. So today, we are still in deterrent presence with uh, 3,000, 3,500 troops, uh, which means a renewed interest. Why this renewed interest? because of the regional instability, the regional uncertainties. It's clear that on one side, Bosnia, on the other side, Macedonia. For the NATO nations, as was mentioned by the other speakers here, you know, K4 is a guarantor of stability, not only for Kosovo, but for the region. And that's why, you know, for the time being, you know, the K4 presence will be maintained. And uh, so I would tell you, will we stay there forever? I wouldn't say, uh, maybe not forever, but for the foreseeable future, we will have this presence maintained because of all the things I just explained. Please. <coughs> Thank you. I think it's um, uh, a great improvement what was also said here, that uh, the uh, K4 NATO presence in, uh, in the region is uh, situation-based, not time-based. It's uh, what is the actual situation on the ground which determines uh, the size and, uh, and the presence. Uh, and it, it leads me also to, uh, to the other question which is not really touched, but if, you know, is this for eternity now? Of course it's not, but, uh, and maybe things will change uh, quicker than we normally think because we are normally talking down a lot of things in, uh, in the Balkans. It's, uh, sometimes it's recent for doing it, but uh, sometimes we should not do it. And uh, there are some, uh, some great opportunities. I would be among those who think that uh, the relation, the Pristina-Belgrade relation, would not necessarily be a barrier to the uh, regional cooperation if we look one to two years ahead. Uh, the normalization process, that's, uh, that's the key. And if it gets restarted, the top-level uh, normalization process, then uh, a lot of initiatives could follow. Some initiative is already in place, and it uh, relates to the, the, the other question we had here. The, the cooperation between the chambers of commerce in, in, in Belgrade and Pristina, that's one uh, signal that, uh, yes, one, uh, they are preparing for a normalization. So if normalization process gets restarted, then uh, a lot, it will, could have a domino effect, which also would have an influence on the NATO presence. Maybe the NATO relation would be different, not a presence of, a, uh, of the military forces, but further and deeper integration into NATO, where membership or not for the countries in the region. And it's not because it's uh, since Christmas that I think uh, the normalization will, uh, will come about uh, next year, but I think uh, it, it's a win-win situation, so if we avoid uh, some of the partners to uh, return to a zero-sum zero uh, approach and keep on the win-win uh, approach as we have now, then it will be a game-changer. Thank you. Next question, please, in the back. Good morning. Christian Swan for Philip Morris International. Um, we have been made aware in these last two days about the challenges that the region faces in promoting uh, rule of law and stability in legitimate institutions. Uh, I would like to bring uh, to your attention one specific case that is the one represented by the Port of Bar in Montenegro. From a business standpoint, uh, there is a general feeling that all resources have been uh, deployed to try to improve the, the promotion of legal business in, in the region uh, through an example like the Port of Bar, I think is quite exemplary. Uh, it seems that both the private sector and the civil society have exhausted all their means to try to bring forward some positive changes that would also reduce the security challenges that are represented by an area that is considered to be a free crime area where all sorts of goods can transit and be distributed across the, the region. And in, in that sense, recent news that came from, from the, the port area indicated that, for instance, uh, I think about a few weeks ago, there have been a series of, of brutal murders and, and, and the uh, institutional uh, criminal leadership of the, of the 
at the port uh, intervene to try to solve the issue, but apparently there is a new generation of criminals that is kind of pre pretending some sort of autonomy in, in managing business there. So, so the, the overall feeling is that it is a hopeless uh, situation, and, and it seems that the only way forward could be through a concerted uh, police, military, operational intervention that, of course, given the lo local sensitivities, uh, the different political interests at stake, uh, for, for sure, is, is challenging. But, you know, when we hear the representative of the European Union mentioning this, this ambitious plan to strengthen infrastructures and create, you know, a common um, system that allows for a more effective movement of goods and, and people and, and, and for the prosperity of the region. When you look at the reality of these specific cases, you're kind of challenged in understanding what could be the way forward. So uh, I think we can take advantage of the presence of such a, an expert uh, panel to, to get your inputs and understand, in your opinion, on this specific case, for instance, how do you, would you see things moving forward and, 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 and what are the... the if there is any hope that things could improve, how would you see that uh, positive change and how that could come about? Thank you. Would you like to? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm certainly not in a position to, to comment on any specific case. Um, what I can say is that the European Union, in the process of the accession negotiations with both Montenegro and Serbia, front-loaded the so-called Justice and Home Affairs chapters, Chapter 23 and Chapter 24, uh, it is the so-called new approach to the accession negotiations whereby the EU emphasizes these two <coughs> chapters which are the rule of law uh, uh, chapters. Um, and I think uh, uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of activities and these kind of uh, 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 features would need to be covered under uh, 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 these chapters. Um, certainly we expect a, um, uh, a proven track record from the candidate countries to address judicial reform, police cooperation, and all the related affairs. Um, the, the bar has been raised, if you like, uh, uh, compared with uh, previous uh, accession rounds on the basis of experience and on the basis of the, of the problems uh, identified. So I think this is a recognition uh, of the fact that we do have uh, some issues to address here. This is a recognition of the fact that the EU also needs to front load its assistance. It does. Um, and this is an expectation towards the candidate countries to put their house in order uh, before they can progress on, on other areas. Other comments, please. Um, thank you, actually, for your comment. Um, I think it's very valid. Um, well, a number of problems in the Western Balkans uh, with foreign direct investment. So, for example, the one that is not of suspicious origin is very often being co-funded by the governments um, in the region. And the problem is that foreign direct investors come and stay only as long as there is a certain amount of influx, uh, financial influx that is coming from uh, the countries. Uh, so that's one problem, which I, on a practical level, would like to see be avoided. But for the region that is striving to decrease its debt and increase its growth, uh, I would say, practically, uh, the European Union has one very good tool, and that is the structural funds. And I'm not quite sure what prevents the European Union um, to use those. It is a political decision, though, that the European Union would need to make, and maybe Mr. Jolton can tell us more about that. But Croatia, for example, although it is a member of the European Union and therefore can use those structural funds, this will be an incredible help to boost up the economy of Croatia in the coming years. I think that this on a practical level could be one of the tools that the European Union could use when it comes to the Western Balkan countries. And that would definitely help heal certain problems in the business community in, and, and in, in development in general. Other comments? No? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Hello, General Gobi. Um, my question is mainly for my friend, Mr. Sula, uh, you said that 
Western Balkans has not been on the recently on the top of NATO agenda as well as the European Union, but now you see a increasing commitment of the alliance in this region. So obviously there is a genuine interest in the security of the region, but uh, is there also the desire from the alliance to go back to his main success story and put aside in the general public the impression of the alliance intervention in Afghanistan and in uh, Libya that, apart from what NATO has done, are not perceived as equally successful. So a strategic communication uh, interest. Thank you, General. That's a difficult one. <laughs> but uh, it's clear that, you know, uh, it's not incompatible not to be the top priority and then to have some interest. Uh, and maybe uh, that's not also the same nations we're talking about, uh, because we have 29 nations in NATO and uh, not all are contributing to the K4 uh, operation. Uh, it is clear that, you know, for those who are committed and remain committed, and then the, the organization as such remains committed, that's at least what's said in the summits and the ministerial meetings. Uh, <laughs> The main reason is uh, clearly uh, your point not to waste the investment uh, and to continue, you know, uh, to, to, to manage the situation. But clearly the focus today is really the topic of our panel here is uh, regional concerns and the regional stability more than the stability of Kosovo itself. That's clear. Uh, and it's uh, the point I got made, you know, that, you know, uh, the K4 presence could permeate uh, towards the region. Already K4 could deploy to Bosnia under the Berlin Plus arrangement, as you know. Uh, but I think there are ways uh, we are thinking about also to be able to uh, deploy in other parts of the region if the situation would uh, become complicated, as you could see in the past months in some neighboring countries. Uh, then in terms of strategic communications, I think, but that's my view, we have to be also realistic. And it's clear that it's very difficult, you know, uh, for uh, the success story in Kosovo and the success story in Bosnia uh, to uh, compensate the bad perceptions we have got from Afghanistan, for instance. Uh, although there again, as a technocrat, I would say that the glass is half full and or half empty. It's not a complete failure because the situation in Afghanistan today is not worse than it was in the 2000s. That's my view. Maybe some will disagree. Uh, and uh, also the bad the publicity we had also on our operation in Libya, where again, as a technocrat, I think NATO did what it could uh, to fulfill its mission and it did it well. But of course, the solution in Libya, as everybody in this room knows, is not a purely military solution. So it means if the other actors don't play their role, NATO cannot be blamed for all the deficiencies of an international community. Thank you. We're coming close to the end of our allotted time. I believe we have time for one more question. And if not, perhaps I could offer uh, just a couple of concluding remarks here um, and maybe uh, provide a little bit of Washington perspective. Uh, a, a, a couple of our uh, panelists alluded to sort of a, a, a loss of U.S. Um, interest or emphasis in the region. I think that's certainly true. Uh, if you look back to the mid and the late 90s, the Balkans were, were obviously uh, a, a case where the United States showed great interest, not only interest, but also direct involvement. Um, earlier in my medical military career, I actually served as a second in command of the very first U.S. unit to go into Bosnia, which was right after the Dayton Accords were signed in December of 95, and later commanded the very first unit that went into Kosovo, which was in June of uh, 99, I believe. Um, and it's certainly true that we can all sort of take some comfort in the fact that there's not been a resumption or a reignition of the violence that characterized the, uh, the early 90s in the Balkans. So that's a big success story. But after 9-11, the United States increasingly found itself drawn into conflicts in the Middle East. And perhaps naturally, uh, there was a view in Washington that uh, uh, the, the Balkans w w were in a better place. Perhaps we could turn the lead over to the European Union. Uh, and I think it's true that there was um, uh, not 
not a loss of interest so much as a distraction to other things. In recent months, though, I would say that there's a growing realization that w what we don't want to see is the, the region slide back into the kind of instability and violence that was such a terrible problem in the late 80s and the early 90s. So, for example, just last week, General McMaster met with, uh, with the foreign ministers of all of the Western Baltic nations in the White House for a discussion that ranged for some 90 minutes or so. So I think there's a growing realization that although the agenda is still very crowded with North Korea and with Syria and with many other things, uh, this is a region that deserves uh, the attention of the United States and the international community. We've got some great advice on how to proceed going forward. I'm encouraged that the view is not all bad. I think the glass half full is a good way to look at it, but there's plenty of work for all of us to do if we want to continue down this path of more uh, uh, stability and increased economic performance and integration into Western democratic structures, which I think we all agree is in the interest, not just of the Western Baltic nations, but of the, of the international community as a whole. So with that, I'd like to express my thanks and gratitude to a great group of panelists. Please join me in a round of applause for them. They're great. And I'll turn it over to Ambassador Minuto Ruzio for some concluding remarks. Uh, great. So we'll, we'll break for coffee until noon, and then the ambassador will offer closing remarks at that time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.